God, everybody that's here tonight, you knew exactly who they are and where they're from. So, Lord, we pray that you'd help them, God, to do business with you. God, whatever the needs are in the place, God, may you meet them. Lord, for the young person, God, that's probably worried tonight. God, maybe they even got a sibling back at the house. God, they're worried about because they don't got a good home life. God, the reality tonight is there's a lot of young people carrying a lot of weight they should never have to carry. God, tonight, let them be a kid. Let them learn how much you love young people. God, if you can do things for a young man like David, God, you can do it in our generation. Lord, if Paul instructed Timothy to let no man despise his youth, my God, you can use the youth in this day to do a great work. God, show these young people tonight the potential they have. God, the power that you have, how you want to use their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody stand tonight. Zach, you come lead us in song. Let's worship. Glad to be in the house of the Lord. Say amen. Oh, that was terrible. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. Amen. It's good to see everybody. Let's sing this old song, uh, The Dearest Friend I've Ever Had. How many of you got friends at school? Oh, uh, not a lot of hands went up. <laughs> y'all some lonely, y'all some lonely people. How many of you got friends? Hey, praise the Lord. Sometimes those friends may not be everything that you thought they would be. Sometimes they may be there. Sometimes they may not be there. But praise the Lord, Jesus is the dearest friend I've ever had. He's never left me nor forsook me. Let's sing this song together. When I was drifting out in sin, I had no peace, no joy within. But Jesus came and made me glad, the dearest friend I ever had. He saved my soul, bless his name. I'll never forget the day he came. He makes me glad when I am sad. The dearest friend I ever had. When Jesus comes, the way is bright. For he's the way, the truth, the light. Cheers me on when I am sad. The dearest friend I ever had, he saved my soul. Bless his name. I'll never forget the day he came. He makes me glad when I am sad. The dearest friend. Sinner, come to Jesus now at his dear feet. Just humbly bow, he'll save your soul and make you glad. The dearest friend I ever had, he saved my soul. Oh, bless his name. I'll never forget the day he came. He makes me glad when I am sad. The dearest friend I ever, let's sing that chorus one more time. He saved my soul, oh bless his name. I'll never forget the day he came. He makes me glad when I am sad. The dearest friend I ever had. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's some good singing. That's some good singing. Let's remain standing. We're going to sing another old song. Brethren, we have met to worship. Now understand something time. You may come in here and the game time may have been perfectly fine and fun and that's all, that's all great. But all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One falls down tonight. 
And uh, you didn't come to hear a preacher. I certainly know you didn't come to hear me sing. And we came here tonight for the Lord. And that's the only reason uh, we came. He's the only one that can help you in the situations that you're going through in this life. So let's sing it out to him, okay? Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the Sing, then he'll call us home to heaven. Then he'll call us home to heaven. At his table we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna. Praise the Lord. You may be seated tonight. You can sit. Miss Madison's getting ready to sing for us. And uh, here's what I want to challenge you to tonight. I want you to let the Lord do a work in your heart. I don't know the situations that you're going through in life. I don't know what you came in here with. But God is the only one that is able to fix the situations in which you're going through. 
could be a divorced home. It could be uh, kids at school not acting right, people that have turned their back on you. Whatever it may be, the Lord knows and the Lord cares. Amen. Worship Him tonight. speak the name of Jesus over you in your hurting in your sorrow I will ask my God to move I speak the name cause it's all that I can do in desperation I'll seek heaven and pray this for you I pray for your healing that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I speak the name of all authority, declaring blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. Oh, he is greater, he is stronger, he's the God of possible. I pray for your healing. The circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come believe it, come receive it, all the power of His Spirit is now forever yours. Come believe it, come receive it, in the mighty name of Jesus, all things are possible. Pray for your healing. The circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus. I pray for revival, for restoration of faith. I pray that the dead will come to life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We're here tonight for a breakthrough. We're here tonight that you can leave differently than you come. I didn't say so that your problems could be solved. I said so that you can leave differently than you come. Because the reality is your problem may still be there when you get home, but you can be different. Your situation may not be fixed when you get back home tonight, but you can be changed. You can be transformed. You are in a safe place tonight. God is here. Listen, you don't have to, you know God's here. It don't matter if you were 12 or 20. You know that there's something different about this atmosphere tonight. What's that? God is interested in changing somebody's life. I didn't say you aren't, you ain't saved. I didn't say you ain't right with God. You could have a real problem tonight. You could have a mama that doesn't treat you right, a daddy that don't treat you right. You could be in a part-time home. I don't know what you're dealing with tonight and you don't got to tell me you can tell God 
tonight. I can't help you if I wanted to. The best of words that I could give you, you'd still leave here wondering if I know what I'm talking about. But a couple seconds down here on this altar spending time with the Holy God, you'd leave here a whole lot different than you came. He's never met a sinner that he could not save. He's never met a problem that he could not fix. Your mountain may be big, but so is your God tonight. He is the God of possible. He is the God of healing. He is the God of breakthrough. He is the God of victory. He is the God of the mountains. And He is the God of the valley. He is everywhere at all times. And He is interested in doing something for you tonight. You may be the most unpopular, uneducated kid in the building, but Jesus wants to do something for you tonight. He loves you. There's no greater news than that tonight. There ain't a greater news that I can give you tonight other than He loves you and He's here. We would be a fool to be in the presence of God and not do something about it. What are you going to do about it? Casting all your care upon Him. Why? Because He careth for you. You know what a lot of young people do? They bass fish. They throw it out and they reel it back in. Before the preacher even preaches tonight, Cast it and cut the line. You may not be everywhere you want to be tonight, and you ain't going to get there overnight. But little by little, you can amount into being what God wants you to be. Say, preacher, I don't got no Christians in my home. I didn't ask you that. You say, preacher, I don't know how to read my Bible. I didn't ask you that. You say, preacher, I've been living wicked as the world. I've been addicted to things that I'm ashamed of. I've been listening to the wrong music. I haven't even thought about God since about last July when I was at church camp. I didn't ask you how you came in here. I asked you, do you want to leave different than you came tonight? He loves you. Whatever you're dealing with. You know how I know people need this? Because a bunch of you right now got tears coming down your eyes. Because you know... Your problem ain't going to be different when you get home. But you can be. Bring it all to Him tonight. Maddie, you sing it again. These altars are open. This stage ain't here for us to just walk up, friend. This is a picture of an altar for us to come down here, cast it, and cut it tonight. Some of you, you need to throw it out and cut it so that you can hear the preacher preach about living a victorious life from this point on. You can't get nowhere in life with all these burdens bearing you down. You ain't going to change your mom. You ain't going to change your dad. You can't heal the disease. If it was in your power to do it, then why ain't it already done? You just need to put your faith in a big God that knows exactly where you are tonight and He loved you enough to get here before you got here so you could get something from him when you got here. Praise God. Do business with him tonight. I speak the name of Jesus over you in your hurting, in your sorrow I will ask my God to move I speak the Cause it's all that I can do In desperation I'll seek heaven And pray this for you I pray for your healing The circumstances would change I pray that the fear inside would flee In Jesus' name I pray that a breakthrough what happened today? I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I speak the name of all authority, declaring blessings, every promise. He is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. Oh, he is greater, he is stronger, he's the God of possible. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I 
speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will bless my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I speak the name of all authority, declaring blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. Oh, he is greater, he is stronger, he's the God of possible. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come believe. The power of His Spirit is now forever yours. Come believe it, come receive it. In the mighty name of Jesus, all things are possible. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. of this old world sometimes I need a word from heaven that everything's okay I try to walk by faith but sometimes I'm so afraid I cannot see how God will make a way but then I think he's never failed me, never left me. Not one time have I cried out, and my voice he has not heard. Never failed me, he won't start today, he will make a way. He's never failed me. As broken as you feel, oh, your troubles, they are real. I know you feel like God's forsaken you. But child, don't lose your faith. He's working while you wait. So just hold on. He will bring you through. He's never failed me. 
never left me. Not one time have I cried out, and my voice he has not heard, never failed me. He won't start today, he will make a way. He's never failed me, never left me. Not one time have I cried out, and my voice he has not heard, never failed me. He won't start today, he will make a way. He's never failed me. Well, it's preaching time. I want to invite everybody to stand with me tonight. And let's welcome Brother Kenny Baldwin here. We're going to let him know how glad we are that he'd come all the way up the road and spend some time with us tonight. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, preacher. Let's do this one more time. On the count of three, say amen. One, two, three. Amen. On the count of three, preach, preacher. One, two, three. Amen. amen. Please take your seat. Thank you so much for being here. How many are glad that we have a God who's never failed us? How about the rest of you? How many are glad that we have a God who's never failed us? What a joy it is to be on a Friday night in an auditorium full of teenagers, you know? A lot of places on a Friday night, the, the malls are full of teenagers, the movie theater is full of teenagers, the, the parties are full of teenagers, but I'm glad to be in a church tonight full of teenagers. Amen. Where God is doing the work, I so appreciate every single one of you in your youth groups and bringing the young people here tonight. Many of you have traveled great distances, distances to be here. Some of you adults worked all day and then brought the young people here and made a sacrifice. I want to challenge the young people to be grateful for those who are investing in your life. I've repeated over and over again to our people at Crossroads, and I'll say it to all of you, in my opinion, one of the greatest diseases that people are dying from spiritually today is the disease of entitlement. That's the spirit that, that somebody owes me something. Somebody drove you here. They didn't owe you. The church opened up their building tonight. They didn't know us. Your mamas and daddies let you go. They didn't know you. Amen. God woke you up this morning. He didn't know you. The, the, the vaccine for entitlement is gratitude. So maybe at the count of three, we all, all say, thank you, Jesus. One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. See, see, when I say thank you, it reminds me that I don't deserve it, but I'm glad I got it. Amen. And uh, when he saved us, we didn't deserve it. When he came to die for us, we didn't deserve us. When he gave us the Bible, we didn't deserve it. But I'm glad he did. Amen. I want to say thank you to Victory Baptist Church, pastor, to you and your folks. We pull up tonight and we see men that are gathered all around the parking lot walkie-talkies and they're talking to each other and many of them have taken the time to be here and your church family that are here and setting up and doing all that they do. What a blessing. We need these meetings, don't we? Amen. Oh my soul. Amen. Some of you are in the thick and thick of the battle and some of you are in a battle and don't even know it. If you're alive in 2024, you're in a battle. Amen. Amen. And the devil wants you. And we're sitting here tonight while there's a war being waged for your soul. Some of you here tonight, you don't know it, but this could be your last chance at getting saved. Yes, sir. Right. And God has brought you to Denver, North Carolina. You say, where's Denver? I've been here twice. I still don't know where Denver is. <laughs> but I tell you where I don't want to go. I don't want to go to hell. Yes. And I know one thing, regardless of whether or not you know a whole lot about Denver, Denver's a good place to get saved tonight. Yes, and I pray that God moves in a special way. We appreciate you young people. So for the next few moments, I, I'll try my best not to be to be, be very long. I'm going to ask a favor out of you, and I'm going to give a favor back in return. Many of you I've never met before. Some of you I have. A great deal of you, we don't have the opportunity to sit down and, and eat over a meal or talk or get to know one another, speak of your background, my background. I, I really don't get the chance to, to earn your trust. You don't know me from Adam. And yet you're sitting here tonight, next few moments, 
and you're going to listen to someone you don't know well, just a human being just like you are. I'm a, I'm a mistake-prone individual. I'm a person that was born in the flesh. I'm a sinner just like you are. But I'm going to ask you for the next few, next few moments to loan me your heart for all you young people. Now, some of you give your heart to all kinds of people. Some of you have given your heart to a rapper you'll never meet. You've given your heart to a celebrity you'll never get his autograph. Some of you guys have given your heart to a girl and she broke it. Some of you girls have given your heart to a guy who has no intention of ever loving you. I'm asking for the next few moments to give me your heart. And you say, my heart's a big deal. If I give you my heart, what are you going to give me? In exchange tonight, I'm going to give you mine. For the next few moments, I'm going to give you my heart. I can't give every one of you $5. I can't give every one of you $1 million. I can't. I can't give every one of you what you want. For the next few moments, though, I can give you my heart and be real with you. I learned a long time ago that teenagers are interested in real people. And uh, teenagers are not trying to get you to be like them. They're trying to get you to be like him. And teenagers don't do very well with a fake. And I, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I don't do well with fake people. So I'm, I'm not coming here to put on tonight. I am who I am by the grace of God. There's a whole lot of people in the world, but there's only one me. And I can't do anything but be me, and I don't want you to do anything but be you. But in Jesus' name, let's exchange hearts tonight and ask God to move in a very special way. I'm privileged to have tonight with me our worship leader at Crossroads Baptist Church, Pascal Todd. Pascal grew up in our church, and I've had the wonderful privilege of watching him now lead worship at Crossroads, uh, sings out of this world, leads our church in worship, such a vital part of our ministry. And I so appreciate you know, him taking the time sacrifice to come down here with me today. He has a lovely wife back in Northern Virginia who's, who's just a blessing to all of us. They both came up into our youth group. And I'm thankful. Aren't you glad that you get to serve God with other Christians? Amen. Thank you for being here and thank you for welcoming us. Take your Bibles tonight and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter number 8. If you don't have a Bible tonight, I hope you'll look on with somebody. I think that when you come to church, you ought to look on look on in the Bible while somebody's reading it and preaching from it. At Church Crossroads, we put the text up on the screen. We want everybody to look at the Bible. We want them to know the words that are being read, know the words that are being preached, but I tell the folks at Crossroads, you're not only looking at the Bible just so you can see what the words say, but you've got to make sure that the preacher is preaching about it. I mean, he's not right because he's up there. He's right because he's up there telling you what God said. And so I want to give you what God said tonight and trust that you'll You'll give me your heart. Stand with, if you would, for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter number 8. The Bible tells us in verse 22, it came to pass on a certain day that he, speaking of Jesus, everybody know that's he. Everybody say, he is Jesus. Jesus. Went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, let us go into the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. Verse 23. But as they sailed, he, who's the he? Jesus. Jesus he did what? Fell asleep. Fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him. Who's to him? Jesus. Jesus. And awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he, who's the he? Jesus. Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he, who is it? Jesus. Said unto them, Where's your faith? And they, being afraid, wonder, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he, who is it? Jesus. Commanded even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Who's him? How many of you thankful for Jesus today? Yeah. Father, in the next few moments, may he, he, Jesus, tabernacle with us here. Thank you, Father, for what you've done today. Thank you, God, what you've done in every life. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done to get every one of us here safely. We, we don't take safety for granted. But in the, these next few, few moments, as the preachers already said tonight, we need a breakthrough. We, we, we need more than just a meeting. We, more, we need more than just a rally. We need more than just a gathering. We need, we need more than just a service. We, we need more than just a get-together. We need more than just an event. Lord God, we need an encounter with Jesus. I'm talking about the Jesus in Luke chapter number 8. I'm talking about the Jesus of the Bible that says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I pray for boys and girls, men and women who come to this building tonight with one thing or another on their hearts and minds, with, with situations and, and all kinds of problems that they're facing that they cannot solve. We come tonight to talk about this man in the Bible, knowing that there is no problem too big. There is no situation that he cannot handle. So in the next few moments, 
May you take me as your vessel. Cleanse me of sin. Empty me of self and fill me with your Holy Spirit. May you do a work in this service like only you can. If somebody in the building doesn't know Jesus as Savior, might that somebody come tonight to a saving knowledge of the truth. Now bind that old lying, cheating, stealing devil. Put a hedge of protection about this place. May the devil in no way hinder the work of the Holy Ghost of God. May everything that you want to be done be done in and through this place. Now, God, we make a promise for what all that is done in this place to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory that's due your holy name. Up the road, watch over my wife, my family, Pascal's wife, as we're gone, and take us back to them tomorrow just as safe and sound as they were when we left them today. All these things we ask and claim in the precious, mighty, wonderful, matchless, holy, lovely, beautiful, powerful name of your Savior, of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. As we were driving here tonight, we were looking around at the streets that were winding and turning and shifting and going up and down and we began to just contemplate what those roads are going to be like in a couple hours when it's dark. And I didn't see very many street lights on the side of the road. And I thought to myself, I tell you, when these lights go out that God put in the sky and there are no lights on the side of the road, it's going to be interesting driving on these winding roads tonight. I hope all of us are going to take our time getting out of here. We were looking to our right and our left and seeing how different rural areas are than some of the areas of the big cities where we're from in Northern Virginia. I pastor just three miles down the road from the Pentagon. I pastor just a few moments from where all of the major decisions in the United States of America are made there in Washington, D.C. We did just 15 minutes of driving, 20 minutes. We're there at the White House looking there at where the President of the United States lives. We look at all of the power. We look at all of the dignity. We look at all of the influence that exists in Washington, D.C. And then I come on a Friday night to a rural Denver, North Carolina. I look at an auditorium and I see that the city here looks different than the city there. The atmosphere here is different than the atmosphere there. But it really doesn't matter whether you're in the big city or whether you're out in the rural areas. One thing remains to be true. There are people in need of Jesus. And I'm here tonight really not concerned about where you came from, where you live, what goes on in your town, how busy things are where you are, whether you have uh, tremendous traffic on I-95 where we're from or whether we're on these winding roads tonight. Could I tell you there's only one way that a sinful man can get to heaven to a holy God and that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And yet when I go to Washington, D.C. and ask the question about being a Christian or I come down to this area and ask the question about being a Christian, it seems to me very baffling that in the United States of America where we print in God, we trust on our money, where the Bible originally was in all of the major places where people made decisions, yet in America you can ask someone what it means to be a Christian and that individual won't have a clue. Some will say being a Christian is being baptized. Being a Christian is doing good works. Being a Christian is going to church. Being a Christian is being born in a Christian home. Being a Christian is having your good outweigh your bad. Being a Christian is speaking in tongues. Being a Christian is being religious. Being a Christian is reading the Bible. Being a Christian is having a certain kind of diet. Being a Christian is doing well to other people. Being a Christian is being moral. Being a Christian is doing what the Catholic Church says. Being a Christian is is being a Baptist, being a Presbyterian, being a Christian, is being a God-fearing person. Listen, these are popular answers that will be given by people not in some third world, third world country, not in a place where Islam is the major. I'm talking about the United States of America where Christianity is just as accessible as you could find a, a Coke or a Pepsi. And yet there are people right here in America, perhaps right here in this building tonight, that don't know what it means to be a Christian. Could I tell you, you can get baptized upside down, frontwards, backwards, with your clothes on or with your clothes off. That will not make you a Christian. You can attend a good church. I'm talking about the church where they preach the Bible, where the pastor walks with God, where the choir sings well, where the facilities are clean, but that won't make you a Christian. I'm saying you can speak in an unknown tongue. I'm saying you can shake the preacher's hand. You can get slapped upside the head with a boom shaka laka laka. That's not going to make you a Christian. You can hang around Christian people. You can be raised in a Christian home. You can go to church three times a week. You can be involved in a youth group. You can come to a youth rally like this and go to the altar. That
that won't make you a Christian. You can treat people right. You can wear a long skirt and a turtleneck. That won't make you a Christian. You can cut your hair just right. That won't make you a Christian. You can set up chairs, break down tables. You can say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, please and thank you. That won't make you a Christian. You can attend a Christian school and graduate from there. You can go to Bible college and graduate from there. You can say you're called to preach and preach every Sunday. That won't make you a good Christian. You can memorize scripture. You can read the Bible through and through. You can quote it like nobody's business. That won't make you a Christian. You can hang around preachers. You can do Christian things. You can sing Christian songs. You can listen to Christian music. You can do all the things that Christians are supposed to do and have all the rules in place that Christians are supposed to have right. That won't make you a Christian. You see, my friend, you're not a Christian based on what you do. You're a Christian based on what Jesus did. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Scarcely for a righteous man some would die, for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God the Father hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And he's the propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, saying, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This is the record that God will give to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the son of God. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes ye are healed. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live repent my friend and ye shall be saved I'm trying to tell you you can't get saved through dead Muhammad you can't get saved through big Buddha you can't get saved through Jesus mama Mary you can't get saved through the Pope or priest you can't get saved by trusting in religion you can't get saved by turning over good leaf you can't get saved by joining a church or getting the right hand of fellowship I'm saying, you say these verses are too fast, you're talking too fast, I don't know what you're saying. Let me break it down to you this way. God's got a way that you can't go over. God's got a way that you can't go under. God's got a way that you can't go around. You must come in at the door. And Jesus says, I'm the doorway of deliverance. I'm the pathway of peace. I'm the highway of holiness. I'm the roadway of righteousness. I'm the gateway of the glo uh, gateway of glory. I'm the master of the mighty. I'm the head of the heroes. I'm the leader of legislators. I'm the overseer of overcomers. I'm the governor of governors. I'm the prince of princes. I'm the king of kings. I'm the Lord of lords. The heaven of heavens can't contain him, let alone a man explain him. You can't get him off your mind. You can't get him out your hands. You can't outlive him, and you sure can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stump him. Pilate couldn't find a fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't hell him, and the grave could not hold him. There's been nobody before him. There'll be nobody after him. There, he had no predecessor. He'll have no successor. You ain't going to impeach Jesus, and he will not resign. He's king of kings and he's lord of lords. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to heaven, I don't have to know your business, your shoe size, your parents, your social security number, but I know this about your business without even meeting you. If you're going to heaven, you went through the same door and his name is Jesus. But that's just the beginning of being a Christian. That just gets you in the family. I mean, once you get in the family, that's not the whole thing about living the Christian life. That, that, that just means you got the right father, huh? You got the right brother, and you got the right destination. But let, let, let me tell you something. Being a Christian is not just about the destination when you die. It's about the journey while you're alive. And I'm concerned in 2024 that everybody's name dropping Christian. You can tattoo a Christian on your arm. That don't make you a Christian. 
no more than pulling up to a hospital and parking in a spot that says doctor makes you a doctor. And I'm concerned that, 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 that singers can get up at, and receive an award and thank God in one phrase and, and, and praise uh, the gay and lesbian society in the next phrase. I, I, I'm, talk, I'm, talking some of you, I'm talking to some of you that want to sing about Jesus tonight and, and listen to Beyonce tomorrow night. That's what she said. I thank God and I also praise the gay and lesbian community. I'm telling you, you can't, you can't thank the God of the Bible and pray the gay and lesbian community at the same time. Listen, I didn't, come to, I didn't come to bash anybody because everybody needs Jesus and you're no bigger sinner as a lesbian than you are as a cheater or a liar. I'm just simply saying, you can't bring God down to you. You got to get saved so God can bring you up to him. I'm afraid that everybody's a Christian because they name it. I'm afraid that everybody thinks he's a Christian because he says it. I'm, I'm afraid that everybody thinks he's a Christian because he goes to church on Sunday. Everybody thinks he's a Christian because of what school he goes to. Maybe you think you're a Christian because you're at the United for Christ Youth Rally. I'm telling you, in these last days, we need some people that understand what real Christianity is all about. We need some teenagers that understand that it's more about a little church service. It's more about what you do at youth group. It's more than just about what you do one time or two times or three times a week. We need some people and understand Christianity is not what you do, it is who you are. In these last days, we need fewer counterfeits, fewer hypocrites, fewer fakes and phonies. And we need somebody who determined by the grace of God to be real. In Luke chapter 18, the disciples are going to get introduced into what I call real Christianity. I mean, they've been following Jesus, they've been around Jesus, they've been watching Jesus, they've been identifying with Jesus. They'd been witnessing what Jesus did, but in, in Luke chapter 8, they're going, they're going to get a crash course on real Christianity. And, and on a Friday night at the United for Christ rally right here in Denver, North Carolina, I want to introduce you to the crash course on Christianity, real Christianity, that the disciples had to take in Luke chapter number 8. And I want to find out if you can pass the test like they did. Because tonight we're not just interested in whether or not you're in the building, we're interested in whether or not you're a real Christian. See, only real Christians are going to make it in a society when three out of four seniors graduate without their virginity. Only real Christians are going to make it when 20% of 15-year-olds have sex by the time they turn 15. I'm talking about only real Christians are going to make it in society when we can't figure out what bathroom to go to. Only real Christians are going to make it in society when we're redefining marriage. I say only real Christians are going to make it in society when every sitcom has at least one homosexual on it. I'm talking about every, only, only real Christians are going to make it in society when you need parental consent for an aspirin, but not for protection to be involved in immorality. Only real Christians are going to make it when a, when a 16 year old can walk in a clinic and have an abortion without her mama being allowed to go to the room. I'm saying you're going to need more than champion power. You're going to need more than a Maya Angelou poem. You're going to need more than squeezing a stress ball. You're going to need something that's real inside of you that you didn't get from Walmart, eBay, or uh, YouTube, Google, or Amazon. You got to get it straight from Jesus. Real Christianity. Look at the text if you would. Tonight, real Christianity begins with the, the Savior's call. Look at verse number 22. It now came to pass on a certain day, just a regular day, on a, on a regular day, just an ordinary day. It wasn't their birthday. It wasn't their anniversary. It wasn't a holiday. It was just a regular day that he, speaking of Jesus, went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. Now, please understand, young people, that Jesus had been teaching parables beside the Sea of Galilee all day long. A parable was something that nobody else was telling. A parable was, was, was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, there was nobody on earth really telling parables because nobody on earth had ever been to heaven but that Jesus man. Now watch this now. You, they couldn't tell earthly stories with heavenly meanings because they'd never been to heaven. But when Jesus opened his mouth, he could tell an earthly story with a heavenly meaning because he lived on earth but he was, but he was from heaven. Come on now. So when he told stories, it was almost like their eyes got big and their mouths got open because he said things that nobody else ever said and, and they started listening to him talk and he broke it down where they could understand it but it was so deep and it was so profound they'd never heard anybody talk like that. And all day long he'd been telling parables and they'd been ooing and on and amazed at a man that could talk like that and then after telling parables all day long and they're listening and entertained by him he looks at them and makes this statement let us go over unto the other side of the lake let me say it again let us go over to the other side of the lake he wasn't saying I'm bored let's go do something he wasn't saying let's kill some time he wasn't saying I want to take you on a trip so you can go have fun no 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 he was extending a call he said to them let us go over to the other side of the lake. Now, look, look at the text if you would when Jesus extended the call notice the call came from the master not from their parents not from their 
their friends, not from their, their authorities. It came from the master. Notice the call came to the minority. He said unto his disciples, verse number 22, he'd been teaching multitudes. There were crowds around them. A whole bunch of people were listening to stories. But when it came time to get on the boat, it wasn't the crowd that got on the boat. It was the disciples that got on the boat. It came from the master to the minority, and it was for movement. Notice he said, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. Watch this now. From the master, Jesus gave the call to the minority, just the 12, for movement. In other words, when Jesus called them, he didn't call them to sit still. He didn't call them to be stagnant. He didn't call them to stall. He called them to go somewhere. Now, you're here sitting here tonight, and it's just a certain day, just a regular Friday in the month of April 2024. But could I tell you, if you're going to be a real Christian, you got to hear Jesus' voice tonight. Listen, I said you got to hear Jesus' voice tonight. Somewhere in this sermon, I've got to disappear. Somewhere in this sermon, you got to quit forget about the man sitting in a chair behind a pulpit tonight. you got to understand, if you're going to do something for God, it can't be my voice you hear. It's got to be Jesus' voice you hear. But, but the, the call's got to come from the master to the minority. Somebody's got to get up tonight, regardless of whether your friends get up. Somebody's got to do right, even if, if your boys don't do right. Some girl's got to do right, even if your best friend doesn't. Somebody's got to be pure if nobody in your class wants to be pure. Somebody's got to go to church when nobody wants to go to church. Talk right when nobody wants to go. See, see, real Christians are Christians who will get in the minority and leave the majority. Some of you would do right, but your friends don't want to do right. Some of you girls want to sell out, but your boyfriend don't want to sell out. Some of you boys want to sell out, but your girlfriend don't. Some of you want to do right, but your friends don't want to do it. Some of you want to do right, but your parents don't want to do it. I'll tell you what real Christians do. They get up when the rest of the people won't get up. They go somewhere when nobody will go somewhere. They do right when nobody will do right. The call came from the master to the minority, but for moving. Here's what Jesus said. You want to go with me? We're going somewhere. You want to hang with me? We're going somewhere. Listen to me, young people. You want to hang with Jesus tonight? He's going somewhere. Now, Jesus ain't interested in sitting still. Jesus ain't interested in, 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 in stalling out. Jesus ain't interested in slowing. You know what Jesus is interested in? Going somewhere. Going some, I want to ask you tonight, is your prayer life going somewhere? Is your Bible reading going somewhere? Is your witnessing going somewhere? Is your worship going? What do you mean is my worship going somewhere? I mean, are you more excited about Jesus than you were yesterday? I, I, I'm asking you, when you go to church, do you just go to church and sit there or do you go to church and go somewhere? You know what I'm finding out? Most Christians don't want to get on the boat. It'd be easier just to stay on the seashore, listen to Jesus tell stories, listen to Jesus entertain. I'm wondering if somebody on a Friday night in April of 2024 said, I'm tired of listening to stories. I'm tired of Jesus just entertaining me. I'm tired of coming to church and warming a pew. I'm tired of youth group just being nothing to me. It's about time I heard his voice tell me to go somewhere. It's time to ride with Jesus. The Savior's call. Notice if you would. Secondly, the servant's commitment. Notice the verse said, verse 22, they launch forth. They launch forth. That's commitment. You know, we live in a day and age where nobody wants to make a commitment. People want to live together for 30 years, but they don't want to get married. Huh? Nobody wants to make a commitment. Nobody wants to make a promise because if they make a promise, they're too afraid they're going to break it. You know what that's called? Being a coward. I mean, listen, somebody's got to sign the dotted line. Listen to me. Somebody's got to put your name down on the paper and say, I said it and I'm going to do it because I said it. Listen to you. Jesus said, I ain't looking for people to go, well, you know, Lord, I'm not just so sure I want to get on that boat. I'm not looking for people that just say, well, 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 I know what you asked me. But, but you, ever, you ever invite people to something and before they tell you they're going to come, they got to find out who else you invited, who else going to be there, what kind of food you're going to serve, what the temperature going to be like, what kind of car we're going to ride in, whose house is going to be over, is it free? Do you have any favors to go home with? What kind of couch do you have? What channel are you going to have the television on? What color is the car? Look, look, you either want to go or you don't want to go. I, you know what I like about Luke 8, 22? The Bible said, and they launched for Jesus didn't tell them how long the boat ride was. He didn't tell them if he was serving them peanuts and pretzels and water, Kool-Aid, or if they were fasting on the boat. He didn't tell them what the weather was going to be. He didn't tell them what they were going to do when they get to the other side. He didn't tell them what the entertainment was. He didn't tell them if they had cable, if they had had satellite, if they had special seats, if they sit certain set in first class, he just said this, let's go and they went. Let, you know what real Christians do? They go because Jesus said so. See, see, Jesus kind of worked kind of like my mama did. My mama said, I don't have to explain myself to you. If I tell you do it, you better do it because I said so. Some of y'all, see, 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 some of y'all hesitate when your mama call you because you get to do that in your house. See, there's a reason why I'm sitting in this chair tonight still breathing oxygen because I got up when my mama said so. See, my mama told me, I brought you into this 
this world, I'll take you out of it. My mama said, I'll kill you and turn myself in. She said, I'll beat the devil out of you. She said, I'll tan your hide. You didn't threaten my mom to say, I'm going to run away. She said, I'll pack your bags for you. You didn't tell my mama I'm going to call the police on you. She said, I'll dial 911 and tell them to pick your black behind up. You see, see what I'm trying to tell you? See, see, mama taught me something. She taught me if you don't go when I say so, you're going to wish you did. Listen, I'll tell you what's wrong with people. They're waiting for Jesus to give them some perks. They're waiting for Jesus to give them some pleasures. They're waiting for Jesus to give them some... Oh, Jesus, I'll stay pure if you'll show me who my boy, my husband's going to be. I'll do right if you'll show me who my wife is. I, I'll, obey, I'll obey God and stay pure if you'll show me I'm, I'm going to be popular. I, I'll surrender to preach if you show me how I'm going to get there. I, I'll do right by you if you show me I'm going to be successful. I'll say yes to you, Lord, if you show me I'm going to have a lot of friends. I'm trying to tell you, Jesus ain't bringing himself down to you. He's coming to this building in Denver, North Carolina and say, follow me because I said so. Be pure because I said so. Read your Bible because I said so. Pray every day because I said so. Obey your parents because I said so. Go to church because I said so. Somebody's got to get on the boat because Jesus on the boat. Not because of the peanuts, not because of the pretzels, not because of the cinnamon buns, not because of the pepperoni pizza. Somebody got to get on the boat because Jesus, listen, thank God for blessings. Thank God for joy. Thank God for peace. Thank God for all the things God gives me. Thank God for family. Thank God for freedom. Thank, look, look, I thank God for pizza. Thank God for fried chicken, macaroni, cheese, and collard greens and all of that. But you better learn to serve Jesus for Jesus. I'm telling you, get on the boat because Jesus is on the boat. Commitment. See, I'm talking about real Christians. Real Christians don't go, well, 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 what are we going to do on the boat? You, you got a TV on the boat? You got DVDs on the boat? You got cushions on the seats on the boat? Well, somebody listen to me now. Some of you kids are ready to be Christians as long as there aren't going to be any problems. See, this was real Christianity. It begins with the Savior's call. It continues with the servant's commitment. But, but then it continues with a stormy crisis. The storm came, verse number 23. Don't you wish that Christianity never had any storms? Don't you wish if you're a Christian, nobody ever talked about you? Don't you wish if you're a Christian, everybody laughed at you? Don't you wish if you're a Christian, nobody made fun of you? Don't you wish if you're a Christian, that meant your parents would automatically stay together? Don't you wish if you were a Christian, that meant your friends would come to church just because you had? Don't you wish if you're a Christian, you'd never battle depression, you'd never have peer pressure, you'd never be tempted? Don't you wish that if you were a Christian, you'd never have to struggle every Don't you wish if you were a Christian, the devil would just leave you alone? Don't you wish you were a Christian, everybody in your neighborhood would just get their pom poms out and say, We're so glad. No, 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 no. I'm trying to tell you, you can be right on the boat where Jesus told you to be, be in the middle of a storm. Notice the storm struck the obedient ones. The Bible said as they sail, who? The ones got on the boat. I don't know. If, if, if I'm looking at things fairly, it seemed to me the people who didn't get on the boat should have got struck with a storm. The people on the boat should have been in peace. Now some of you in the building don't understand this. As soon as you start doing right, it seems like everybody starts doing you wrong. See, we don't lie to you here. We want you to come to the altar tonight and get right, but that don't mean that everybody at your house is going to be happy about it. See, I'm saying you go back to school and listen, there are going to be some people at your school, public and Christian. Come on, somebody help me preach. Maybe we got a few folk in here that think you all that in a bag of chips because you go to Christian school. Some of the biggest devils I ever met were in Christian school. So just because you leave the house with a halo on doesn't mean that them horns ain't showing. Huh? I, I, I'm just simply saying, and, and by the way, we, we know there's only one devil, but, but Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, to the devil. You know what you're saying? Peter, you're letting the devil influence you. And I know kids that are right in a Christian school that will let the devil influence you. And I'm telling you, there are people in your Christian school that will graduate from a Christian school that will go to school on Monday with their little uniform on and sit in Bible class looking like a little angel. And when you tell them you went to a rally in Denver, North Carolina and got right with God, there's some people sitting right in that Christian school that are going to be mad that you got right with God. Some of your own parents are going to fight against you. I said the storm struck the obedient ones. 
And young men walk up to this altar tonight and say, I'm going to get right with God and surrender to preach. And all of a sudden, people start going against you. It's amazing. You, 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 you want to mispractice with the coach to go to some, go to some, some vacation or mispractice to go to some other thing. And nobody gets into it. You start missing practice to go to church. And all of a sudden, the, co the coach starts persecuting you. You, you, you want to get off of work to go to a youth revival. And all of a sudden, your job starts telling you shame on you. You want to go gamble. You want to go party. You get off and do everything. And there's somebody in the building tonight that's getting a little disillusioned with the Christian life because you you're doing right, but people are doing you wrong. And you're going, I don't understand why I'm on the middle of a boat in a storm when I did exactly what Jesus said. I tell you, just because you obey Jesus don't mean you don't have no storms. I said the storm struck the obedient ones. The storm was seen by others. No doubt on the, on the seashore, there were multitudes that didn't get on the boat because they were too afraid. They had no commitment. And I guarantee you they're looking over, the, looking over the water right about now when that storm starts coming. And they're looking at them disciples way out there on that little boat. And somebody that didn't get on the boat saying, mm -hmm, I'm glad I ain't get on that boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought about it, but I'm glad I didn't because I'd hate to be on that little bit of boat in the middle of that storm. And, and listen, listen, listen. There's some of you. There's some of you that are at this youth rally tonight. And some of them are sitting at home. I'm glad I didn't have to go to that church service tonight. I'm glad I don't have to read my Bible like they do. I'm glad I don't have to pray like they do. And the moment you start going through a storm, just like Job's friends, they'll start talking about you and running you down and saying, I'm glad I didn't serve God. I'm glad I'm not in the middle. Look, 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 look. I'm trying to help you tonight. When the storms come, don't get off the boat. When the storms come, don't jump in and look for a life jacket. When the storms come, don't doubt in the night what God gave you in the light. When the storms come, oh, I wish I didn't serve God. I wish I wasn't a Christian. I'd have more friends if I was doing other things. If I was part and I'd be more popular. I was in that public school acting a fool. I'd have more friends. If I didn't have to be like Jesus, more, more guys would like me. If I didn't act like Jesus, I'd get more girls. Let me tell you something. You'd rather be on the boat with Jesus in a storm than hanging out in the sunshine with the devil. The storm was seemingly overwhelming. The Bible said they were in jeopardy. It's one little pitter-patter storm. I'm talking about they thought they were going to die. That's what the word jeopardy means, in danger of losing their lives. And I'm telling, look at me tonight. I told you, loan me your heart. I'm telling teenagers tonight, I'm saying if you serve God, there are going to be some times in your life where you feel like you're not going to make it physically. There are going to be some times in your life. I, I tell you, just four years ago, I lay in the hospital fighting for my life. And I listen, this didn't happen to me out there partying and drinking and cutting the food. You know how I got sick? I got sick going around and preaching the word of God, the word of God to people. That's how I almost lost my life in the middle of the work of God could have sat up there mad with God. Why don't you? And listen, I thought several times, Lord, why'd you give me COVID? If you'd asked me who to give it to, I could, could, could have given you a good list of folk to give it to. Some of them preachers, amen. Yeah, but, 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 but you know, I, I found out, I found out, it's like Job said to his wife, what? God should only give us good things and we should never have, listen, we should only have good days when we serve God and never have, but listen to me, if God gave us what we deserve, we'd be burning in a devil's hell. God doesn't know us anything. Somebody's got to realize that the call and the commitment are no more Christian than the crisis. Yeah. 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 Somebody tonight is, is going through a tough time. Mm -hmm. Your parents are going separate ways. God, yep. You're struggling with depression. You're cutting yourself. Real thing. Some of the people you love the most are fooling around in drugs and some of the people you care for the most, that, that boy you've already made up your mind you're going to marry just doesn't love God and you're going through a crisis on whether or not you're going to pick Jesus or Jimmy. That's true. Yes, sir. And now you're questioning whether or not you should have ever got on that boat. I went to school with them. They surrendered to preach just like I did, but they're not preaching today. I, I, I want to ask them if they were here tonight, what was God not thinking when he called you? What, 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 he, what, 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 what some, somewhere after when he called you to preach in, in high school, did he call you in college and say, oh, I'm sorry, I knew I called you in high school, but what had happened was I really didn't mean to say I changed my mind. I don't want you to preach no more. I just want you to go out there and do it. No, 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 no. God didn't change his mind. You changed yours. Stormy crisis. Look at the passage of Scripture. 23. He fell asleep. Turn to the person beside and say, that's a setup. How many believe Jesus is God? How many believe Jesus knew the weather before he told him to get on the boat? How many know that Jesus knew that storms were scary before they got in one? Huh? How many know that Jesus knew that that boat was not a carnival cruise ship? Now, now, now listen, what do you think them disciples felt like 
when he invited them on a boat, knowing he was doing, and got them in the middle of a storm, and while they were in a storm, he was asleep. There are going to be some times in your Christian life where you're going to be going through your biggest storm, and it's going to feel like Jesus is asleep. You're going to pray, and you're going to feel like he's not listening. You're going to go through trials. You're going to feel like nobody's paying attention. You're going to be out in this world and feel like you can't get in touch with Jesus, and you're going to feel like he's asleep. Listen to me. This is what happened in their lives. But I'm telling you, in the midst of the Savior's call, <clears throat> every once in a while, I run into a Christian who <clears throat> tries to sound real spiritual. I don't know why they woke Jesus up. They should have been able to face this storm without one. I mean, let the man sleep. He'd been telling parables all day long. He Clearly, he went down into the bottom of the boat because he was tired. Let him sleep. Let him take a nap. Y'all ought to be able to deal with storms. Hadn't y'all learned something from Jesus? Let me tell you something. I have no problem with the disciples waking Jesus up. As a matter of fact, if I'd been on that boat, I'd have ran down there and woke him up too. Now, if you think you all that and you don't need to wake Jesus up because you didn't learn all your special phrasing, your spiritual remedies, and you got it all down where storms don't scare you, will you go ahead with your bad self, I'm waking him up. No problem with waking him up. The problem is what they said when they woke him up. Notice what they said. Verse 24. They awoke him saying two words. Say it what? Come on. What is it? Master, master. Come on, say it twice. No, no, say it a little bit louder. Master, master. No, 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 nothing wrong with that. Look at the next two words. What are they? Can I ask you a question? How them first two words go with them second two words? Somebody help me preach. How you going to put we perish after you said master, master? You can't put them two together. <laughs> Listen, if you're talking to the master, you can't perish. <laughs> I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. How are you going to say master, master, and then say we perish? Listen, we are the most contradictory people on planet Earth. We talk like God is real on Sundays and act like God's dead on Monday. We talk like God is real on Sunday and act like God wasn't alive on Saturday. I'm trying to tell you, if you can say master, master, then don't proceed with we perish because as long as Jesus is on the boat, you ain't going down. Amen. The problem was they forgot his presence. He was there. Listen to me, young person. You can't go down in this present world when God is with you. This sin can't destroy you as long as you know that God is with you. This devilish foolishness can't destroy you as long as you know that God is with you. You have God's presence. They forgot God's promise that master, master, we perish. What do you mean we perish? Y'all must have forgot what I said to you when I invited you on the boat. Let us go over until the other side of the lake. Now, please answer something to me, disciples. How y'all going to sink in the middle when I say we're going to the other side. Can I ask you something, young person? The next time you face a difficulty, yeah, it's 2024. Yeah, we live in a crazy world, but Jesus said, being confident in this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform to the day of Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Hey, listen to me. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. I'm persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. I'm saying, yes, we live in a crazy world. Yes, we have a lying devil. Yes, we have a wicked flesh. But we've got Jesus' presence. We've got Jesus' promise. Watch this now. And we've got Jesus' power. I'm telling you, he arose and rebuked the wind and the water and they obeyed him out of love to watch Jesus get up from his sleep. Most of us wake up from our sleep we need to wash our face. We need to jump in the shower. We need an alarm clock. We need a cup of coffee. We need about two hours to figure out our bearings. I'm telling you Jesus got up like act like he never went to sleep. He rebuked the wind. Aren't you glad that the Savior we serve can talk to wind and water and they obey him? Do you, do you know anybody else that tells wind what to do and wind listens? Do you know anybody else that tells water what to do and water listens? Do you know anybody else that does what Jesus, I tell you, ain't nobody like him. He went to sleep because he was a man, but he got up and told the wind and the water to be quiet because he was God. And I'm telling you, there's nothing in your life that Jesus can't command. He can command your depression. He can command your addiction. He can command your bad temper. He can command your generational curses. He can command your drug use. He can demand, command your impurity. He can command your runaway mind. He can command your bad peer pressure. He can command those temptations in your life. You stop acting like you're you're going to die. You're not going to make it. If Jesus is on the boat, claim his presence, claim his power, and claim his promise. Wow. 
I want you to picture these disciples. I'm almost done. Getting off the boat. How many know they got to the other side? Somebody say amen. Yeah. And guess what I'm coming to tell you tonight? You'll get to the other side too. Yeah. Now I want you to picture these boys walking off the boat on the other side. Twelve disciples, right? Everybody say twelve. I don't thank you, little child. Bless your heart. Somebody listening in here. Tell the disciples. Bible said they got to the other side. They're getting off the boat. Now remember what happened on the boat. They saw his power. On the boat, Jesus, after being awakened, stood up and said, hey, wind, water, hush. And they hushed. Come on, don't read the Bible so much that you don't act like this stuff is phenomenal. Right, right, right. Yeah. You, have never, you have never watched somebody go outside in the middle of the rain and say, rain, stop. Thunder, close your mouth. Lightning, go bye-bye. And all of a sudden, the sky was clear. That don't happen, but Jesus did it. Yeah. So I want you to picture these 12 dudes that just watched a man do something that dudes don't do. And they're coming off the boat and they're like this. You think I'm making it up? Look what the Bible says. They looked at them, they, they, they said among themselves, what man of this? What man of man is this? You know what manner of that man is this? That's old English for who does this? Are you serious? Who does this? So, so they're getting off the boat trying to wrap their head around what just happened on this ship. This man got awakened from his sleep, stood up and told a storm to quit. First of all, if you're talking to storms, you're weird. Okay? If you know anybody that talks to storms, you don't hang around them. Because there's something wrong with people that talk to storms. But I tell you, there's something right about a man that talks to storms and the storms listen. These fellows are going, we've been around this Sea of Galilee a bunch of times. We ain't never heard nobody tell no storm to stop and it stop. And they're coming off the boat like this. What man? Can you imagine him nudging you? You see that? Did I miss something or am I dreaming? Peter telling his brother. Peter looking at Andrew. Andrew, did you see him do? Yeah, I saw the same thing. He got up, no warning, said, wind and water, be quiet, and they obeyed him. Wow. So they're walking off this boat with their mouths dropped open. Look what he just did. And before they can even get off the boat real good, all of a sudden, they look to the right, and out of the cemetery comes a naked man running like this. I ain't making this stuff up. Bible said he had so many demons in him. When Jesus cast the demons out, they went into a couple thousand pigs. That means this fella probably had a couple thousand demons in him. These fellas still trying to figure out how that boat got to the other side and that storm left just because Jesus had gone somewhere. And I, why are they trying to figure out what happened on the boat? Here come this naked man running through the town. He got chains on that he broke loose from. He's foaming at the mouth. He's a menace to society. These fellas don't know what to do. Get happy about the storm or get scared of this fool over here. And all of a sudden, they look at Jesus, shift gears from what just happened on the boat. And the next thing you know, he's dealing with this crazy man. They look, they, they take a double take and they look again, that man got some clothes on. They take a double, take a look again, that boy sat down somewhere. They took a look, that boy act like he got a 4.0 in high school. And they all of a sudden said, what in the world? I'm trying to figure out how to let Jesus take that old crazy naked man, put some clothes on him, take that old crazy wild man, have him sitting down, take that man out of his mind, and that boy starting to tell you A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Something done happened in that boat. And these fellas trying to scratch their head. Peter and Andrew still trying to figure out the boat. James looked at John and says, bruh, I ain't never seen nothing like this. This man done put, this man done put, put this, man, the crazy man, the man got some clothes on. People in town talking, we ain't never seen that man with clothes on. His mom and daddy said, we don't even know who he is. We don't even claim him no more. Jesus, Jesus put some clothes on the man and then cast the demons out. The pig done gone crazy and the man act like ain't never been nothing wrong with him. And these disciples are looking at Jesus and going, good grace is alive. On the boat, he, he made us wow. He got power over the deep. Now we get on the other side and find out this man don't just got power over the deep. This man got power over demons too. You see, you got 
Peter and James, and you got Peter and Andrew and James and John, and they just scratching their head going, I don't believe this, I don't believe this. I ain't never seen nobody like this. I ain't never seen nothing like this in my life. This man, oh my goodness, this man is something else. Oh my goodness. And they're trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And while they're still trying to wrap their head around it, here comes a woman got a 12 issue of blood, had an issue of blood for 12 years. She come crawling along through the crowd, and all of a sudden she touches the bottom of Jesus' clothes. Next thing you know, that woman up hopping and jumping and saying, he healed me, he healed me, he healed me. She started testifying. 12 years ago, I went to the doctor with a blood bleeding problem, and the doctors couldn't solve it. He gave me medicine, and medicine couldn't solve it. I spent all my money, and money couldn't fix it. But I left the house early this morning, crawled all the way up here, because somebody said the man was in town. Just a few moments ago, I didn't dap him up. He didn't shake my hand. He didn't slap my head. He didn't rub no oil on me. I just touched the bottom of his clothes. This man got more power in his clothes than most people have in their whole body. I don't feel no bleeding. I don't have no pain. I don't need no medicine. He done healed me. Peter and Andrew still over there still trying to find out what happened on the boat. James and John over there talking about, is that man really got his clothes on? Now all of a sudden, this woman got her issue of blood. And Thomas, who was a doubter, said, hold up. He's not only got power over the deed, power over demons. He got power over diseases. And right about that time, there's a man named Jairus who's standing beside him right now, whose daughter's about ready to die. And he was taking Jesus to his house, and they come tell Jairus, don't even bother Jesus no more. Your daughter done dead. You shouldn't even bring Jesus to the house. Jesus looks at Jairus, and she ain't dead. She's asleep. Jesus and Jairus head to the house. Peter, James, and John about the only ones that can go. They, the other one done fell out. They don't even know what's going on. And all of a sudden, they go to Jairus' house. That woman lay down dead. Everybody crying, oh, the poor baby. She dead. She dead. She dead. Well, poor baby. She's a poor baby. Jesus looked down at her and said, Talitha kuma unto thee. Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. The girl sits up like she never went dead and asks for an eight-pack of, of Chick-fil-A nuggets. I'm telling you. And all of a sudden, Peter, James, and John go, good gracious, alive. We ain't never seen anything like that. That man got power over the deep. That man got power over demons. That man got power over diseases. And that man got power over death. Now, let me give you this, and I'm finished. They don't see any of this on the other side if they ain't get on the boat. Now, now we, we got some, 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 of you teenage, some of you teenagers at the rally tonight. You're at the rally, but this is all you're going to do. This is all you're going to do, just kind of put your toes in the water. I don't really go get all in for Jesus. Let me just put my toe. I don't want to swim. I don't want to get all my clothes wet because if I get in the water, I got to take a shower. So I'm just going to put my feet in. See, I'm going to tell you why your opinion of Jesus is this big. Because you're still sitting down listening to stories. I said, see, 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 you're never going to meet the storm chaser if you don't ride with him. I, I don't understand. Those people go to church. They just get so excited. They raise their hands. They shout. They go to the altar. They act like they're just so pumped up to go to church. It doesn't seem that exciting to me. You pick up your Bible and quit reading just a psalm every day. You might think more of Jesus. See, there's a whole bunch of people on the other side. You know, you know what their whole mindset of Jesus is? He's a great storyteller. That's it. But there's 12 fellas on the other side. <laughs> Could you imagine when they got back to see them people that didn't get on the boat? Y'all don't know Jesus. Oh, yes, we do. He tells great stories. I mean, Mr. Rogers who? I'm talking about Jesus. He tells great. And Peter, James, and John said, y'all think that Jesus is just a storyteller? You should have rolled with us last week. That man don't just tell stories. That man tells the deep what to do. That man tells demons what to do. That man tells diseases what to do. That man tells death what to do. And the rest of them are going, I've never seen him do that. And Peter says, ride with him. So I come to tell you on a Friday night, it's time to ride with him. You can't, you can't just come here and, by the way, I don't have time for this, but, but on, on, the, on, the, on the boat they saw his power over the deep. On the other side they saw more power. Amen. Chapter number nine, they not only saw more power, but chapter number nine, they were sent to carry out his plan. 
Then he goes and sends them out to go witness. Guess who he sent out? The boat riders. <laughs> Some of you in the building like, pick me, pick me, pick me, Jesus, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Ooh, ooh, I want to do great things for Jesus. I can see Jesus coming down to all those people with your hands up and say, oh, you want to you you do something great for me? Yes, Jesus, I want to be on the team. I want to be on the team. Show me your ticket stuff from the boat ride. Oh, well, what happened was I didn't ride because I, I get a little seasick. Well, put your hand down. I can't use people to, to witness the verb if they're not a witness the noun first. Everybody wants to be used by Jesus. But he can't use you if you don't know him. And you can't get to know him sitting on the seashore saying, tell me stories, tell me stories. At some point in time, you got to quit listening to stories and you got to get on the boat. See, that's the difference between those that just say they're Christians and those that are real Christians. My question tonight to you is this. Are you real or not? We will find out. Christianity is more than just coming to church. Christianity is the Savior's call. The service commitment. The stormy crisis, the supernatural comfort, and Christianity is the subsequent conclusion. On the other side, I'm glad years ago I got on the boat. I didn't know, preacher, when I said yes to Jesus at nine years old to preach. I didn't know in April I'd be in an auditorium full of hundreds, hundreds of teenagers in Denver, North Carolina. I didn't know that. He didn't tell me I'd get to preach all over this country. He didn't tell me about that pretty girl I'd meet in, in Laverne, Alabama that would end up being my wife. Right. He didn't tell me about them kids. He didn't tell me about Pastor and Crossroads Baptist Church. He didn't tell me that I'd almost die of COVID, but he'd give me more impact in my weakness than he ever did in my strength. He didn't tell me all that. He didn't have to. He Come just on. said, get on the boat. Yeah. And him saying it was enough for me. But I'm living, I'm living in the consequences. And I'm glad I got on. Amen. I wonder 20 years from now if there'll be some, some men and women that'll say, April 2024, I didn't know all of it. I didn't know about the mission field. I didn't know I'd be pastoring. I didn't know about my wife and all these precious kids. I didn't know, I didn't know I'd, I'd be a mother. I didn't know I'd be teaching in a Christian school. I didn't know I'd be serving in my church. But I knew on a, that Friday night Jesus said, get on the boat. I got on. And I'm glad I did. Let's bow our heads all over the building. Now, would you listen before you move? Let me talk to all of you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Don't move. Just let me talk to you, okay? How many nights say, preacher? I know if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. I know it. Would you put your hand up? I know that if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. I'm saved and I know it. Be honest. Put your hands down. Now, if you just raise your hand, you can put it down. Let me ask you some questions. If you are saved, you're going to heaven and you know it. How many would say to me tonight, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. But I'll tell you what, I need to step up my real Christianity. There's some things he's calling me to. I want to hear his call. I want to make the commitment. I don't want to abandon him when the crisis comes. Because I know he's got comfort for me. And how many of you would say, I want to see what he has for me on the other side. How many of you tonight that say you're saved would admit tonight, I'm saved, but I need to work on being a real Christian. Come on, all over the building, would you put your hand up? Look at them. Oh, my son. Oh, God bless you. In just a moment, I'm going to ask every single one of you to respond. But let me ask the most important question I'll ask tonight. Would you listen, please? How many of you say to me, preacher, I'm not sure if I die tonight, I'd go to heaven. Listen, please. I'm not sure if I die tonight, I'd go to heaven. But I'm positive. I don't want to go to hell. Listen to the question again. Let me say, preacher, I'm not sure if I die tonight, I'd go to heaven. 
but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Be honest. Now listen, if you have your hand up, I want you to look at me while you have your hand up. Because once you look at me, I'm going to tell you I see your hand, okay? I'm not sure if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. But I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to start on this left side. No one's looking but me and the workers. Look at me if your hand's up. I see your hand. God bless you. Put it. Thank you. See your hand. You can put it down. Yes. And I see your hands, both of you. Thank you. And I see your hands right here, both of you fellas. God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else over in this section? Thank you, young man. I see your hand. And you. I see your hand. God bless you. Right over here. I'm not sure. God bless you, young lady. God bless you. You can put it down. Yes, and you. God bless you. I'm not sure if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. But I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Slip it up long enough for me to see it. Wave it. Yes, I see your hand. God bless you. Anyone else? Yes, I see your hand. Yes. And yes, I see your hand. God bless you. I'm not sure if I didn't spot your hand. Yes, I see your hand. God bless you. I'm not sure if I died today. Yes, I see you. I'd go to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Please pray for me. Anyone else? Yes, I see your hand. Anyone else? I'm not sure if I died tonight. Yes, I see your hand. But I don't want to go to hell. I'm not sure if I died tonight. I'd go to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Anyone else? Just let me pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just wave at me until I see your hand. God sees your heart. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for being honest. Anyone else? I'm not sure if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Yes, God bless you, young man. I'll wait just a moment for, for a couple others, if anybody else. Yes, back there. I see your hand, young lady. I'm not sure if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Yes. God bless you, young man. This what's this, this this real talk. You ain't telling God something he don't know already, but you got to admit it if he's going to do something with you. Yeah, I see your hand, buddy. I'm so proud of you for being honest. Someone else. Come on, you loan me your heart. Would you be honest? Thank you, young man. God bless you. I'm not sure if I died tonight. I'd go to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Pray for me. Anyone else? Yes, God bless you over there, young person, young man. Anyone else? And you too. Yes, God bless you. Anyone else? I'm not sure if I died tonight. I'd go to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Now listen, now, now I, I'd like all of you youth pastors and workers to, to, to be available to deal with these folks. I, 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 I'll get them to you if, you if you got something to tell them. Now listen, well, I'll try to get them to them. The Holy Spirit's got to get it to them, but I'll, I'll direct them if they'll listen. I want to talk to every single one of you young people that just put your hand up. All of you that just raised your hand and said, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Look at me. All of you to put your hand. I'm not, I love you too much to embarrass you. I don't come here to pick on I didn't get in the car and drive six hours to pick on you tonight. Because I care. Look at me. All of you to put your hand up. Listen. Look at me. I can't, I can't see all of you, but I'm looking your way. Look at me. Jesus loves you. If you were the only sinner on the whole planet, he would have still died for you. He loves you. Now, you admitted tonight you're not sure you're going to heaven. He doesn't want you to be unsure. He wants you to know. Now, I'm, look, look, remember I asked you to loan me your heart? Now I'm going to loan you mine. Come on, we, we got to, this is, this is a mutual thing. Here, here's what I'm telling you. you. Trust me tonight. The greatest decision you can ever make in your life is coming to accept Jesus as your Savior. And there are people here tonight who can show you how you can leave this building tonight and know that you're going to heaven. Now, all of you looking at me that just raised your hand. Wouldn't you want to know that you're going to heaven so you don't have to worry about going to hell? Wouldn't you want to know that? Wouldn't you? Those of you that raised your hand. So here's what I want you to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. We're not going to play, we, we're not going to play the twist arm. Bay. I'm not going to tell you stories to scare you. And all. I'm not going to manipulate. I'm not going to try to play God. I want you to be real with me. In a, in a few moments, I'm, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, every single one of you that put your hand up, and said, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I'm sure I don't want to go to hell. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave your seat and come meet me right here. And somebody in this building, one of these workers, is going to take a Bible and show you how you can know you're going to heaven. We're serious. As soon as I count to three, if you're serious, all right? This is, this is heaven and hell we're talking about. One, two, three. Come on, you put your hand up. Come on, come on. Let's mind the Lord. Come on. Come on, all the way up front. These workers will come receive you. Come on up, come on, just right here. Stay right here, all of you. Yes, yes, I'm so proud of you. All around the building, if you're glad they're coming, come on, let's give God the praise. And let's... These workers will come get you. 
These workers, these, these workers will come help you. I'm so proud of all of you. Bless you. And if, you, if these are kids that came with you and you want to deal with them, we understand that completely. You might know them better. Let's just get some workers to get each one of these. Doesn't matter if you're, you're a male worker, you want to work with some of these other ones, that's fine too. Yes, any of you others put your hand up. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know it. You're not sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. But you don't want to go to hell. Would you? Come on, would you come, anybody else? I'm not sure if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. Does everybody have somebody working with them? Anyone else in the building? I'm not sure if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven, but I don't want to go to hell. If that's you, get up from your seat, would you? We'll get somebody to help you. Don't stay in your seat. God don't want anybody in hell. Don't you let him not tell you that. If you're a Christian in the building, why don't you bow your head right where you are and start praying over everybody that's up here on this altar that God would give them a, a receptive heart. This is why we came. My, my, my. You can't be a real Christian if you're not saved. I will ever love and trust It's not too late for you to come. It's not, I promise you. And let's make sure that every single one of these that gets dealt with, we get a, we get a record of it so these churches can have these names. We could, maybe we have some cards or something along the line to, get, to help these churches be able to follow up on these young people. Brother Nate has those cards. Save your holy night. Let me feel the holy Bless your heart. Yes. Spirit truly know that thou art mine. You workers, they've, they've got cards for you to, to be able to follow up on these. What a beautiful sight. Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Now the Lord draws. That's not us preachers. This is God has to do it. Just we just have to give the seed. If you're saved, this ought to do something for you, shouldn't it? Yes, it should. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. We've got these cards to fill out to help get these names into the hands of these churches. Listen, we, we, don't, want, we don't want tonight their salvation to be the end of it. We want it to be the beginning. Every one of these people that get saved needs to be baptized and discipled. 
and then plugged into the task force of getting this job done all around the world. Hey, listen, we're getting more players on the team tonight. We got to work, we got a whole world to read. We're not just trying to get them registered on the team, we're trying to get them in the game. Get them to come to the practices, right? That's what church is. What a blessing. What a blessing. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with that. The Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. I say when one sinner repents. It looked like more than one up here tonight. Come on now, let's get some joy down here. Come on, act like you got some joy. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. Now that piano's going to play, keep playing. Now let me talk to all you saved folk. Huh? If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. Time to get on the boat. Somewhere in that real Christianity course, you found yourself. Could you put your hand up? Right? Remember you raised your hand a little bit ago? He's been calling you. There's a call that he's dealing with you about something. And you're kind of sitting back, uh, I'm not ready for commitment. Somebody's got to board the ship tonight. Maybe somebody's in a crisis. Your boat's rocking. You've come here tonight at Youth Rally, and you're in Youth Rally, but you're going back home to a rocking ship. Stay on the boat in the crisis because the comfort's coming. And the comfort is going to guide you to the conclusion. God's got something else to show you. You can't get the product if you skip the process. You can't arrive at the destination if you don't endure the journey. So you put your hand up and you said, look at me. Come on, we're almost done. You're going to get to them funnel cakes in a minute. But what about real Christians? Are you watching the news? Fakes and slouches ain't going to cut it. We need real Christians. So look up here, everybody, from all the way over there to all the way over there, from the front all the way to the back. Look at me. If God spoke to your heart about being a real Christian, and somewhere in that course, call, commitment, crisis, comfort, conclusion, you found yourself in need of improvement, I'm going to give you a chance to do something about it. Now listen, we don't have all night. We got to get back out to work and live for God. So we're not going to play around. I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, if God, if God spoke to your heart and God told you to do something about it, I don't want you to be waiting, putting your toes in the water and contemplating about it. I just want you to get up, come to this altar, whether your friends come, whether your youth group comes, whether your husband comes, your wife comes, your parents come, whoever. If God told you, you need to be a real Christian and he spoke to your heart, I want you to mind the Lord tonight, all right? One, two, three. God spoke to your heart. Come on. Every last one of you, put your hand up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All to Jesus I surrender. Some of you others, you put your hand up. You put your hand up. Now what you going to do about it? I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. I surrender. I wonder if there's any young people on the altar tonight that say, I'm praying, but I, I need to make a decision for God, and I'd like somebody to pray with me. Would you slip your hand up, any of you young people? You're kneeling on the altar, but you'd like somebody to pray with you where you're on the altar. Would you slip your hand up?
making a decision for the Lord. Write it down and hold yourself accountable. Grab one of those cards in front of you. Just read it. If you need, if you made a decision for God, write, write it down. Take it with you. Just look at it and put it up there. I give myself to thee. God spoke to your heart tonight and you need to make a decision. You write down what he did. Put it down on the table. You'll never regret getting in the boat with Jesus. I tell you one thing. I guarantee you there are a whole lot of adults in this building tonight. You know what they will say they regret? That they didn't get on the boat sooner. Do I have any adults to say amen to that? That's why they work so hard to try and get you on the boat. Don't waste your life. And, and some ships, once they leave the dock, there's not a chance to get on them. Get on while you can. And mighty kind of Jesus to even invite us into his work with him. If I, listen, if I was God and I knew me like he knows me, I wouldn't invite me. Well, that's the God he is. Amen. What a God. What a God. All over the building, if you're happy in the Lord, let's give God the praise tonight. What a blessing. <laughs>